everyone, Dr. Hall here, and we're going to start talking now about the heart. So lecture 24, the heart. So let's do a quick review of the components of the cardiovascular system that we've discussed thus far. So blood, you'll recall, is a specialized connective tissue. It's liquid connective tissue. The liquid ground substance is plasma. And then we have this formed element, which are our erythrocytes, leukocytes, and platelets, also called thrombocytes. And we've talked about all of the solutes that are in plasma, as well as the three important plasma proteins, albumin, fibrinogen, and globulins, also known as antibodies. We then talked about the different types of blood vessels. Arteries, which carry blood away from the heart, need to withstand high pressure. So they have a very thick, smooth muscle and elastic layer in the middle. And that allows them not only to be flexible and withstand high pressures, but also to be customizable. You can dilate them or constrict them. Capillaries then are the smallest blood vessels, only one cell layer thick of simple squamous epithelium, which allows for easy diffusion of solutes across the capillary wall and into the tissues and from the tissues back into the capillary. Those solutes are going to move via diffusion, so from areas of high concentration to low concentration. We're also going to have movement of fluid in the capillary bed, which is going to be dictated by the balance of hydrostatic pressure, which is usually more prominent on the arterial end, and then osmotic pressure, which is usually higher at the venous end. And then we talked about veins, which are relatively flimsy, especially compared to arteries. They're going to carry blood back toward the heart, and they have not only to be compressible in order for our skeletal muscle pump to work, uh, but they also have valves to prevent backward blood flow. We also talked about regulation of the blood pressure, which is done via the autonomic nervous system, so your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. The sympathetic nervous system, when activated by the medulla oblongata in response to signals from your baroreceptors in the aortic arch or carotid arteries, is going to either signal the sympathetic nervous system, which will cause vasoconstriction, and also increase the heart rate and the contractility of the heart, or how hard it is pumping, or will turn off the sympathetic, in which case you will get vasodilation and a decrease in contractility, and turn on the parasympathetic nervous system, which will decrease the heart rate. We then talked about blood vessel anatomy and learned the names of a whole bunch of different blood vessels and talked about two special circulations. So that's circle of Willis in the base of the brain, which receives blood flow from both the vertebral arteries via the basilar artery, as well as the two internal carotid arteries, and the hepatic portal circulation. So you'll recall that all the veins draining the intestines that are loaded with all the things that you've absorbed from what you've eaten have to drain into the hepatic portal vein, go out into capillaries in the liver to get processed, then drain through hepatic veins before it's safe for that blood to enter the inferior vena cava. All right, let's talk about the heart. So when we think about the functions of the heart, whenever I ask this question in class, which is what I usually do, people say it pumps blood. And I say, yes, absolutely. Uh, but let's get a little bit more finessed. Right? So one of the big jobs of the heart is to pump oxygenated blood out to the body via the aorta, right? Okay, but it's also got to then receive that blood from the lungs. So that's also a job of the heart is to collect that oxygenated blood from the lungs. And then in order to get oxygenated blood from the lungs, we have to send blood out to the lungs, right? And if we're going to do that, we had to receive the deoxygenated blood from the body via the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. So when we look at the jobs of the heart, right, you have to receive blood and pump it out, either from the body and then to the lungs or from the lungs and to the body. And so the right side of the heart is going to actually do this first set of jobs. And you can see I've coated it in blue for you because that's going to be handling deoxygenated blood. And the left side of the heart is going to receive the oxygenated blood and send it out to the body. So we have two different pumps, right? We have the right side and the left side. Each one is receiving blood from a certain place and sending it out to a certain place. 
So therefore, right, we have these two separate pumps. It has to be a double pump. We also want to make sure that the left side of the heart never receives deoxygenated blood because we don't want it to pump it out to the body, right? Only oxygenated blood. So we need to make sure that this is a continuous circuit, right? So you go from one to the other. So this is a diagram of what that kind of looks like conceptually, right? This is not an anatomic diagram. So blood, let me grab my little arrow here. Okay, so blood from the body that's deoxygenated is going to move into the right side of the heart, which is then going to pump it out to the lungs, which is then, then it's going to drain into the left side of the heart, which will then pump it back to the body, right? So this continuous circuit, these two different sides of the heart. So We've been talking about sides of the heart, and I think that's really useful when learning the heart, but I also want you to be aware of two other terms, pulmonary circuit. So that refers to just this upper part of the slide. So that refers to just pumping the blood to the lungs and then that blood coming back into the heart. And then the other half is the systemic circuit, right? So out to the rest of the body, right? So pumping blood out to the rest of the body, and then that blood goes back to the heart. So that's another way to conceptualize or talk about circulation. This is just another schematic. I kind of like it because it's showing us some of the blood vessels that are doing this job for us. Again, this is a schematic, not an actual anatomic diagram. But we can see the right side of the heart is coated in blue. We've got blood coming into the heart from the vena cava, the superior and inferior vena cava, into the right side of the heart. And then it's going to go out to the lungs here. That's our pulmonary circuit. It's going to get oxygenated, come back into the left side of the heart, and then get pumped back out to the body again. So again, just another way to represent it. Uh, different people find that different diagrams are helpful to them. So let's just talk for a minute about that pulmonary circuit, right? So the way that the deoxygenated blood is going to move to the lungs is from the right side of the heart and out through the pulmonary trunk, which divides into the right and left pulmonary arteries. Right? The blood's then going to go into the lungs, it's going to get rid of its carbon dioxide and pick up some oxygen, and then it's going to come back into the heart through the pulmonary veins right, on each side. So you notice that there's something a little bit weird and different about the pulmonary arteries and veins compared to what we're used to seeing. So the pulmonary arteries are blue because they are carrying deoxygenated blood. They are still arteries because they are carrying blood away from the heart. So remember when I said that's the definition of an artery, carries blood away from the heart. And the veins, the pulmonary veins, are red. They're veins because they're carrying blood back to the heart, but they're red because they're carrying oxygenated blood. So just remember, if it's the pulmonary arteries and the pulmonary veins, the colors are flipped from what you're used to seeing with arteries and veins. So each side of the heart, the right side and the left side, has two chambers. So first of all, there's an atrium. So the word atrium actually is used in architecture as well, right? It's kind of a big open area. It's kind of a lobby. So you may not know it, but that area of Jarvis Hall that you walk into if you're coming from the MSC, that's actually called the Jarvis Hall Atrium. Uh, so it's kind of a big lobby, uh, an initial entering and receiving area, right? So each side of the heart has an atrium where the blood comes in via the veins, because the only way blood can come to the heart is via a vein. And then we have a ventricle, which is a highly muscular chamber that's then going to do the pumping of the blood out of the heart via arteries. Oh, we're going to talk about the valves later. I'm going to skip ahead. All right, I just want to show you this. So here we see we have the right atrium receiving blood from the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. Blood is then going to move from the right atrium into the right ventricle, <coughs> then out the pulmonary trunk to the pulmonary arteries, out to the lungs to get oxygenated. Then it's going to come back in through the pulmonary veins, enter the left atrium, 
right, that receiving area, and then come down into left ventricle, which is muscular, which will then pump it out to the body. All right, now let's talk about the valves. So we want to make sure when the ventricle contracts that none of that blood moves backward into the atrium. So we're actually going to have a one-way valve. So we're going to have a one-way valve, and those are called the AV valves for atrioventricular. So if you think about it, the ventricles are going to pump pretty hard, right? They're going to contract pretty forcefully. We call that diastole, ventricular diastole, when the ventricles are contracting. And so it's going to be some pretty high pressure, right? Especially with the left ventricle, it's pumping hard enough to send blood to all the different parts of the body. So these valves have to be highly specialized in their structure so that they can withstand that high pressure. So there's two vocabulary words for you here the chordae tendinae and the papillary muscles. Let me show you what those look like. So this is an illustration of the inside of a ventricle, right? This is the left ventricle. In this example, here's the left atrium up here. So blood can move down from the atrium into the ventricle. And we have this valve that it can move through no problem. When the ventricle contracts, these leaflets of this valve, these leaflets are going to slam shut. And then we have these string-like structures. So if you've heard of heart strings, this is what they are, called the chordae tendinae, right? Chordae tendinae right there, that are going to keep those valves from blowing all the way backwards up into the atrium and letting blood go back. They are held in place by the papillary muscles. You can see that here as well. So we have chordae tendinae, strong cords that hold the valve closed and don't let it kind of blow backwards and let blood back into the atrium. And then the papillary muscles, which are these kind of cone-shaped protrusions. Remember in the skin when we talked about dermal papilla? Any type of papilla is like a finger-shaped or conical protrusion. So these uh, papillary muscles hold these heart strings. They hold the chordae tendinae. Here is an actual uh, human heart, and it's been dissected out. We're actually looking inside the right ventricle. And so again, we can see the papillary muscle here holding on to the chordae tendinae. And here is part of the valve. You can see here it says tricuspid valve. That's because we are in the right ventricle. So on the right side, the valve has three cusps or three leaflets. So it's called the tricuspid valve. On the left side, it has two cusps or leaflets. And they thought it looked like a bishop's mitre, which is the hat that a bishop wears. So it's also called the mitral valve. So sometimes you'll hear bicuspid valve, but the most common term is mitral valve. And of course, whenever I think of a bishop, I think of this guy. So those of you who are Princess Bride fans, hopefully you enjoyed that. Those of you who have never seen the movie, I highly recommend it. All right, so again, blood coming from the body through the superior and inferior vena cava into the right atrium moves through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle, and we can see our chordae tendinae and papillary muscles. Then it's going to go out the right ventricle into the pulmonary trunk, pulmonary arteries, out to the lungs, going to come back from the lungs through the pulmonary veins, enter the left atrium, go through the bicuspid valve into the left ventricle with its chordae tendinae and papillary muscles, and then out the left ventricle. And this part you can't see very well because it's posterior to the right ventricle. So in this diagram, the left ventricle looks smaller than the right. That's not true at all. We just can't see it because it's posterior. All right, so then blood's going to come out of the aorta. So tricuspid valve over here, mitral valve over here. You may have noticed that there were also some valves sitting in the pulmonary artery and the aorta as well. Those are called the semilunar valves. So if we look at what we've done so far, right, right atrium, 
is going to drain into the right ventricle, blood moves through the tricuspid valve, right, out to the pulmonary artery, lungs, pulmonary veins, left atrium, through the mitral valve, into the left ventricle, and out the aorta. So we also have another set of valves called the semilunar valves. We have a pulmonary valve, and we have an aortic valve. You can see the pulmonary valve right here. And you can just see a little tiny bit of the aortic valve right here. It's just as big as the pulmonary valve. It's just posterior to it, so we can't see it well in this diagram. Here's a slightly better diagram, not by very much, but again, pulmonary valve and aortic valve. So the structure of these valves is really interesting. So they have these three cusps to them that are kind of like little cups that are attached to the side walls of the arteries. And so if blood tries to go backwards, they balloon out kind of like a parachute and close. But if blood is going forwards in the direction it's supposed to, out the aorta, out the pulmonary artery, away from the ventricle, they just blow open no problem. So it's kind of a neat little structure. And if you think about it, these valves are just preventing backward flow from gravity for the most part, right? They're not having to withstand the force of a ventricular contraction like the AV valves are. So these valves don't need to be as strong and sturdy as the AV valves. So that's why we have a different structure for these. <coughs> Again, same diagram, pulmonary and and aortic valves. So let's look at how these valves work as the heart is pumping. So when a ventricle contracts, which is called systole, right, we're going to increase pressure in the ventricle. That's going to force the AV valve shut. It's going to be held shut by the chordae tendineae and the papillary muscles and blood will go out through the semilunar valve, whether it's the aortic valve or the pulmonary valve, it's going to be the same thing. Um, so that will open. When the ventricle relaxes, blood might try to fall back into the ventricle from the aorta or the pulmonary artery. That's going to cause that semilunar valve to balloon out and close that off. And the AV valve now is going to open, and blood can move from the atrium down into the ventricle. So the series of movements that the heart is going to go through is actually called the cardiac cycle. So now we're going to take a few minutes to go through the phases that, of the cardiac cycle itself. So timing is going to be really important here uh, because we need to make sure that we move blood as effectively and efficiently as possible. So the first thing that's going to happen is that blood is going to come into the atria and some of it will stay in the atria and some of it will move passively down into the ventricles. I think of this kind of like if you go to the theater to see a play and everybody comes into the atrium, everybody comes into the lobby, and some people just mill around in the lobby for a while, but other people go right into the theater. It's the same kind of thing. So that's going to be the first thing that happens, this kind of passive feeling, everybody's relaxed. The next thing that's going to happen is the atria are going to contract, and so any residual blood that's in the atria is going to get pushed into the ventricles because we want to fill the ventricles as much as possible before they contract. So again, using the same analogy, it's like when the show is about to begin and the ushers come out and they play those little bells or they tell everybody, okay, come into the theater now. That's what the atria are doing when the atria contract. The ventricles have to be relaxed at this point so that the blood can get in. And then once all the blood is in the ventricles, oh, I forgot to tell you, another way, another metaphor for the atria is, I don't know if you know this, but in Tokyo, Japan, which is a huge city, they have a very efficient but very crowded subway system. And so they have this whole scenario where when the subway train comes into the station, the people have all been lined up and everybody files into the subway car. And then 
just before the subway car is going to take off, they actually have these uniformed people who wear white gloves that then push people in to try to jam the subway car as full as possible. So that can be another metaphor for what the atria are doing, right? A lot of the blood has already moved into the ventricles, but we're going to give an extra push and a shove to get them as filled up as possible. All right, so then step three is once all the blood is in the ventricles, all the people are in the subway car, everybody's in the theater, then the ventricles are going to go ahead and contract and send the blood either out to the lungs or to the body. So this sequence of coordinated events is called the cardiac cycle. And we're just going to do a little bit of vocab here to which I've already alluded. So when we think about the heart rate, everybody thinks about how it has to pump, which is true, right? So the heart has to pump and contract, push blood out. We call that systole. The way I remember that that is what is systole is I think S stands for squeeze. But the other thing that the heart has to do that doesn't receive much attention is it also has to relax and fill with blood. And that's equally as important, right? If you're not filled with any blood, you can pump all you want. It doesn't do you any good. And so that is called diastole. So systole is the squeezing or the contraction. Diastole is the relaxation. So the cardiac cycle. We've already talked about these steps, but now we're going to use more technical terms. So step one, both the atria and the ventricles are relaxed. They're in diastole. And so all of the chambers are going to fill with blood. Everybody's coming into the lobby and into the theater. Step two, the atria are going to contract. So atrial systole, but the ventricles are still relaxed. So step two is atrial systole. We're going to push all the remaining blood from the lobby, from the atrium, into the ventricles. And then step three, the ventricles are going to contract, and they're going to pump blood out of the heart. So you can see these muscular walls are pushing inward and pushing the blood out right, to the lungs and the body. Now, when the ventricles are contracting, the atria are already in diastole. They're already relaxing and getting ready for the next cycle, right? So this is a continuous thing. As soon as we finish step three, we go right back to step one again. So what is causing the sound of a heartbeat, right? So when we think about the cardiac cycle, what could it be that's causing that bump, 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 bump? bump bump sound. So we have two sounds, bump bump, bump bump, and somebody decided to call them lub and dub. So the first sound is lub and the second one is dub. So it goes like lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, right? So that's how your heartbeat sounds. So what is actually causing that? Well, it's pretty weird. The lub is your AV valves closing during ventricular systole. So that sound is your AV valves, your tricuspid and mitral valves, slamming shut as your ventricles squeeze blood out through the pulmonary artery in the aorta. So weird, right? So that first sound is your AV valves slamming shut, right? Those doors are slamming shut, lub. And then the second sound, dub, oh, there's lub down there. The second sound, dub, is when ventricular systole is done, and then the semilunar valves close to prevent backflow into the ventricles. So that's dub. So if you just kind of think about it for a minute, it's crazy, right? So lub, dub, lub, dub, it's AV, semilunar. AV semilunar. So that little tiny space between those two heart sounds is ventricular systole. It's quick, right? It's really fast. Pretty cool. All right. So in summary today, we talked about how the heart is a double pump. Each side has an atrium and a ventricle. The right side receives deoxygenated blood from the body via the inferior and superior vena cava and pumps it out to the lungs via the pulmonary trunk and pulmonary arteries. That oxygenated blood then is going to come back into the heart to the left side via the pulmonary veins, enter the left atrium, left ventricle, and go out to the body via the aorta. 
We have the AV valves, which have to be really strong, tricuspid on the right, mitral on the left. Uh, so they have those papillary muscles and chordae tendineae. And then the semilunar valves that prevent backflow into the ventricles don't have to be quite as strong. Then we talked about the cardiac cycle, right? Phase one is everybody is relaxed. Phase two is the atria encourage everybody to go into the ventricles and get ready for the main event. And then stage three is ventricular systole. So the ventricles are gonna squeeze, the AV valve slam shut and cause that first heart sound. And then we go back to step one, right? But I'm describing it now because it makes sense. Oh, I spelled it wrong. There we go. And the semilunar valves are going to slam shut and cause the second heart sound. So I hope that made sense. Let me know if you have any questions and have a great day.